So here we are. And uh, our course is uh, how to predict and reduce post-classic ectasia, current concepts and technologies. And I welcome all of my instructors, co-instructors, and friends, and uh, Dr. Ashi Mohan, uh, Dr. Ashu Agarwal, Dr. Bupesh Singh, Dr. Purendra Bhaseen. And uh, I have had a message with, from Dr. Rohit Shetty uh, for that he'll be joining us a little late. So it doesn't matter, he's uh, third in line. So by that time he should be here. And uh, then, then we go forward when he comes in, then we'll have complete faculty as of now, we have all the uh, you know, uh, speakers here. And uh, then uh, I have to start my PowerPoint. Sorry, I have to start my PowerPoint. Yeah. And here we are. So can you see my PowerPoint? No? No, sir. Okay. Okay, here we are. Yes, sir. Please put on slideshow, sir. Yes, sir. So my talk is on interpretation of risk factors, ablation profile and uh, percentage of tissue ablated, and that is PTA. And I'll be going forward with the, my talk. So the most important fact is that corneal ectasia after LASIK is a complication characterized by progressive corneal thinning and bulging, causing significant visual loss. And uh, majority of times we can identify the risk factors, especially preoperative uh, changes on topography or tomography. But there are you know, patients who have normal preoperative tests and they still develop ectasia and that is still a mystery. So first few recognized reports were published by Theo Seiler in 1998 and he uh, termed it as keratectasia. And 50% of these cases present within the first year and 80% present within two years. More males, younger patients, higher myopias and thinner corneas are the major uh, issues which lead to this. And uh, there were multiple suggestions and uh, the issue was to understand the biomechanical strength of keratoconus corneas. And brilliant microscopy also found that mechanical loss was focal and primarily concentrated within the area of the cone. Uh, the, uh, so this is basically a small optical zone of the ablation was important. And uh, transmission electron microscopy found that there is epithelial hypoplasia or hyperplasia. There are breaks in the Bowman's layer, hypocellular stromal scarring, thin residual bed strengths, and uh, interlamellar crafts and thinning and loss of rigidity in stress-bearing regions of stroma. And uh, these factors were you know, found. So what LASIK uh, risk factors were uh, too thin or irregular corneas in the large pupils, high refractive error, unstable vision, dry eye, younger age, or degenerative or active immunological disorders. So review of the retrospective cases gives us uh, improved surgical skills, the screening criteria evolved, uh, the residual stromal bed thickness analysis was done and thin cornea or thick flap are important risk factors. And there, you know, other are oblique cylinder, pachymetry, posterior surface ablation, elevation, uh, in inferior versus superior corneal power, posterior best width sphere, and most important, which we recognize as a keratometry. Additional factors were age and asymmetry between two eyes, like uh, axis difference of 90 degrees or something of 
that and progressing towards pellucid marginal degeneration of form for us KC. And also the other risk factor was form, you know, uh, enhancements. So this was a risk score where uh, the points were four, three, two, one, according to the residual stromal bed, age, pachymetry, and uh, spherical equivalent. And per percentage of tissue altered is a later uh, thing which has come by Marconi Santiago of Brazil. And he found that uh, the thickness of the tissue was very important as to how much you remove. And that was the most important that. And I remember in 1992, uh, when I started doing ALK, uh, my, I was told by my mentor and the teacher <laughs> in Germany that 50% uh, is the max you can uh, go in the uh, cornea. So including the thickness of the flap and the uh, you know, uh, tissue re removed cannot be more than 50%. And I, that is why I have never gone wrong in my calculations. I have never thought about leaving 250, 300, whatever. If it is a 500 cornea, I can go up, up to 250. If it is 600 cornea, I can go up to 300. And if it is a 450 cornea, I cannot go beyond 225. And that is my take always. And I have never gone wrong in this. The tensile of the cornea is not uniform. And progressive weakness is there in posterior two thirds. So what we are seeing is the anterior one third is most important. And that is where the PTA is very important because a lot of it is gone in the flap. And a lot of it again is gone gone into the uh, you know ablation. So PTA is actually full flap thickness plus ablation depth here divided by central corneal thickness. And it should not go beyond fifty percent. And that is very important that I want to emphasize again and again. Above forty percent PTA is significantly associated development of ectasia and patients with normal preoperative. Cornea. So this is very important. Even in normal tomography or topography, you should not do anything more than 50%, whether you want to leave 250 or 300 or 225 or whatever is your cutoff, that's not important. The more important thing is what is the residual bed, bed thickness and which should be more than 50%. So these are a couple of uh, pictures where you see all this, uh, you know, red, cor uh, steep cornea, and everything is uh, looking, you know, like a very dangerous red flags everywhere, except for the fact that thinnest local is 533. And if you go forward and ectasia, you know, the K max is again 47.7, which is again a, a factor which many people will give importance to. But I feel that this, as long as this is red and this uh, is normal and these parameters are within normal limits. There is no risk of uh, doing any LASIK in these cases. This is the other eye of the same patient. So this is uh, what it is. That is my take. And either this here, positive island of elevation in the posterior cornea here and uh, normal anterior surface. And this is again, posterior cornea is very important. As long as posterior elevation is good, you can go forward. But a posterior ectasia is significant enough to cause a displacement of cornea thinnest point. And there you have to be very cautious. This is another factor which is very important. This is the standard and uh, you know a very clear cut, very easily visible uh, you know para maps which say that okay, this case is going to be a troublesome case if you do anything with the cornea and we must avoid such kind of cases with anterior, posterior, all parameters if you look at and the corneal thickness, everything is not good. So this is of course, any one of us will avoid. So in, and this is very important, uh, you know, because uh, if you look at the keratometry, keratometry is 546. So keratometry alone, is not a parameter. There's, you see the posterior float and posterior float is very, looking very aggressive and red and, you know, so all these cases, 552 keratometry, uh, thick corneal thickness, 
but still the keratin uh, this uh, posterior float is not good this is not a good idea to for this eye to be taken as a for a laser refractive surgery thank you very much and uh, uh, so okay so any questions on this and then we go forward no questions such at books question so uh, can i just make a comment dr bharti yeah why not why not please so uh, pta is a newer metric that has come in and it's very helpful and uh, you know uh, uh, and gives us a very good idea of what we are doing and dr bharti as he said he, i mean before all these concepts came in he followed his principle of his mentor that uh, not more than 50% ablation so if it, essentially it boils down to the same thing so it's an important metric one it gives us a single numerical figure based on the things but the fact is it should only be considered if the topography is normal yeah. it does not make any sense if the topography is not normal and we try to get the pta and say okay fine it's going to work no it's not going to work when everything given that everything is normal this is an additional tool to help you and it should not be taken in isolation because a lot of times uh, me being a cornea surgeon a uh, lot of uh, rishi would have seen face the same issue people say ek cheez batao dekh ke just tell us one thing that we know what is where to do and where not to do let this not become that single metric that people right, right. just go by so that's right. the word of caution a note of caution that i want to uh, emphasize otherwise very rightly said i should very it's a, it's a very, very right. it's a very important adjunct to whatever else you're doing and you also pointed out in your uh, presentation that thicker cornea everything's fine you could go by pt and say okay fine i'm going into this surgery but you see the other things that are happening there the belen ambrosia display in one two everything's knocked out and so you just can't carry on in such a case so that's the important thing that just thought, i thought i'd just highlight that thank you thank, thank you thank you ashu that's, that's absolutely right i think a single metric uh, in any form of ectasia prevention would not be appropriate uh, in fact uh, what i'm going to speak about also will add to that uh, and uh, in fact santiago's work is based on normal topographies and but he has not looked at corneal biomechanics so that's going so, to be the, the next thing yeah so next speaker is uh, dr rishi mohan and he will be talking the field of his interest interpretation of biomechanical analysis he is a great ophthalmologist and a scientist dr rishi mohan thanks dr um, i'm trying to share my screen and uh, here we are oops right can you see my screen everyone yeah you can okay so um, we got we've just been introduced to uh, the development of ectasia and uh, dr bharti has very nicely introduced the subject and thank you so much for having me on the course sudank along with the lovely co instructors we had the experience in the past and i greatly enjoyed this course so no financial disclosures uh, though i wish i did um so we all know what the keratectasia is it's a progressive anterior shift with central steepening thinning astigmatism uh, myopia uh, irregularity and then uh, visual symptoms and uh, it used to be fairly common it has reduced but the number of surgeries have gone up so much that we still do see our occasional ectasia patients but it used to be almost half percent uh, going back into the early years of refractive surgery so what are the causes and uh, so we were thinking of thin stromal beds we looked at that aspect with pta coming in undetected topographic abnormalities which have slipped under the radar biomechanical properties which have uh, largely been overlooked over uh, at least the first two decades of uh, of refractive work but are now slowly coming to the forefront uh, some studies suggesting that there's a late stromal melting uh, but there was no underlying inflammation that has really been uh considered to be the reason why this happens so one thing that seems to be fairly certain which is the current concept for ectasia development that it is a focal weakening in the corneal structure which then starts a cycle of biomechanical uh, decompensation leading to a localized thinning and steepening and there is a two hit hypothesis which proposes that there is an underlying genetic predisposition and this is coupled with an external or an environmental factor 
And this could be rubbing as in keratoconus. It could be uh, a surgery. Uh, it could be contact lens use. So any of these could be the second hit that has then uh, made that underlying genetic predisposition worse and made it become manifest. So the changes in curvature, elevation, thickness, which we can see on the pentacams and the OCTs and these other devices are essentially secondary elements, while the primary abnormality is related to the direct biomechanical weakening. So it comes uh, as a bit of a surprise as to why biomechanics hasn't actually uh, taken the forefront in the uh, ectasia detection. So the ectasia development occurs due to a chronic corneal biochemical de biomechanical decompensation or weakness, resulting in stromal thinning and corneal protrusion. And the advent of 3D tomography, such as the OB scan and the shine fluke imaging, is proven as a significant advancement to characterize the corneal shape beyond front surface topography. But these screening tests are limited to corneal shape, and the biomechanical assessment has now been possible with the ORA uh, in the last 15 years and now the Corvus ST uh, over the last decade. And direct clinical biomechanical evaluation is now recognized as paramount, especially in the detection either of mild ectasia cases and the characterization of the susceptibility for ectasia progression. So the segregation of these high-risk individuals preoperatively who may experience corneal ectasia after LASIK from patients who can undergo the procedure safely is of crucial importance. And this we can do by looking and understanding what biomechanics really is. So look at this coil spring, which is the uh, automotive uh, uh, shock absorber, and it comprises of a spring element, which is here, and a viscous damping element, which is here, the shock absorber, so to speak. And the strain or the deformation that one gets is directly proportional to the stress. The more the stress or the applied force, the more is the deformation. It is independent of the length of time or the rate at which the force is applied. Whereas the viscous resistance, which comes from here, is a resistance based primarily on the speed at which the force is applied. And it is these two uh, principles in the corneal tissues, which allows us to look at uh, the corneal biomechanics. So tonometers essentially make static assessments. That means they will make an assessment on the corneal surface when applination has been reached, which is a steady state. Whereas the ORA and the Corbis ST make dynamic measurements and they monitor the entire movement of the cornea in response to this air impulse. And that is what allows us to capture these, um, these abnormalities. So what is the problem with these corneal thickness-based assessments? One is that all corneas are not the same and thickness is not resistance. So if you take, say, a piece of pine wood and a piece of oak wood, the same force that would bend pine will not bend oak. And that tells us that thickness is not really the only, only uh, thing that is in, the, in this area. So the, uh, the, uh, uh, the objective uh, to uh, produce uh, a minimal ectasia and to minimize the potential by leaving a minimum thickness of cornea in place is not entirely satisfactory because of the unknown biomechanics of that particular cornea. And thickness is not strength, as I've said earlier. There may be soft corneas which require larger residual stromal thicknesses to be left behind. And there may be hard corneas which may be able to tolerate more aggressive ablation safely. Now let's look at this population. So here's a population in red where there is an average preoperative hysteresis seen by a biomechanical device like the Aura. And we know that the CH goes down along with the CRF following LASIK. But you can see in this particular patient here that this average, the pre-LASIK the pre CH is lower than the average population post-LASIK CH. So this is the patient you need to be really concerned about and actually avoid uh, considering him for a refractive procedure. So when one looks at the, uh, the values that come out of these machines, uh, we note that as the air pulse goes up, there is an in-signal peak when applination takes place. Then the cornea becomes concave as the pressure of the air builds up. And then as the pressure of the air goes down, the cornea comes back from its uh, concavity to give you a second applination phase, which is the out signal. Uh, and the difference between these two in and out because of the lag behind effect uh, is called hysteresis. 
So let's look at a case report. So here's a patient who's 22 years of age. He has, uh, she has uh, uh, about a three, three and a quarter uh, doctor of uh, uh, refractive error. Uh, uh, the only thing here was the, the 47K on the left eye, which was slightly outside the range, which should have made us uh, look at this more carefully. A topography suggested that there may be a suspect, suspicion of a subclinical keratoconus on the left eye. Uh, the uh, the pachymetries were low, but look at the CH and the CRF values. These are way below the normal 11s and 12s that we see. And this patient would certainly be a high risk for, uh, for a keratectasia, especially if a LASIK is considered. Another patient with a slightly higher PA, but absolutely normal case, a little bit of corneal distortion, very good corneal thicknesses again. But again, look at these uh, CH values, way below normal and this patient would again be uh, the, uh, at risk for developing ectasia. The KMI values, which is the keratoconus match index, which is something that the ORA gives us, also has value. And here you can see uh, both on the left eye in case two and on both eyes in case one to be fairly abnormal. And these are the patients one should watch out for. So the signal quality as well as the signal uh, configuration has a lot of value in assessing these patients. It's not just CH and CRF, which are numbers. And again, people will ask for those magic numbers where how to take a decision, but one must look at the signals. And you can see here, this is a beautiful normal cornea signal where there's a good signal amplitude, good clean points, fairly smooth. And the signal is flat with the same amplitude on both sides. When we look at the keratoconus patients, other than the CH and CRF values and a thin corneal uh, center, there is low amplitude peaks, they are sharp and thin, there's a raw signal bounce that happens because of the tremulousness of the cornea, and there is a noise in the raw signal. And these can actually reduce the repeatability of these values as well. In a subclinical keratoconus, again, one can see that the CH and CRF are uh, both uh, uh, are low, as well as in severe keratoconus where there is absolutely no uh, values available. The moment the air puff hits the cornea, the cornea flattens, and thereby you get hardly any signal amplitude at all. So here you don't have to look at numbers at all. You, no question, this is keratoconus. So identifying ectasia signals, also they start to mimic the keratoconus where there is a low amplitude, noisy and messy signals. The signal quality does not improve over time and often is present in one eye and not in the other. So if one looks at the uh, the, the problems here, both keratoconus and normals have a significant degree of overlap in numbers. And that's one of the problems with uh, corneal hysteresis. This is the keratoconus max inject, which tells us how the uh, keratoconus patient is likely to be more of a, a problem here. The, the KMI here is 0.69, uh, which is subnormal. The new Corvus ST is a shine fluke technology <laughs> instrument. And uh, this has generated the biomechanical corrected IOP, like the IOPCC, the Corvus Biomechanical Index. And now combined with the Pentacam, the Tomographic Biomechanical Index and the Biomechanical Glaucoma Factor. Just to summarize, mild ectactic cases typically are at very high risk for iatrogenic keratectasia if an additional biomechanical weakening is induced. Corneal topography and tomography have increased their ability to identify these ectasias at earlier stages. Direct clinical biomechanical measurement is recognized as paramount for augmenting the specificity and sensitivity for identifying cases with this kind of uh, susceptibility. And the corneal biomechanics with the available of these new machines is becoming a key evaluation in ectasia detection and filling the missing link in the screening for high-risk refractive cases. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rishi, for your wonderful uh, talk and very lucid, very interesting, very clear. Uh, any questions? Uh, Rishi, uh, I remember, I must credit you with the fact that you're probably the first one in the country to work on this very important aspect of uh, uh, corneas, the corneal biomechanics. And I remember you used to have a Rikert device. That's correct. You still have the same one or... I do. Um, in fact, that was a device. Uh, and in fact, the Rikert company is still very proud that this, this device is now still running for 16 yeah. years. 
it carries a single digit serial number so it was mm. in the original series that device is no longer under production okay. in fact rikert unfortunately got sold i will say unfortunate because it took their focus away from uh, an equipment that was beautifully being developed they have a smaller version of the ora now which gives us numeric values but doesn't give us this signal and uh, i find that to be not so useful because those who can you know it's like having an ecg versus having the interpretation of an ecg it's mm-hmm. very different so the the signal actually gives you so much more information and there are 37 parameters in the wave which can one can look at so the ora in its uh, original format is no longer under production um, it is now uh, gone into the realms of history in a sense but yes i have the same device uh, the ora that is now available is mostly a tonometer uh where it is being used uh, for iop correction rather than for ectasia screening so the corvis st i think would now be, probably be the the device to look at and to follow for the future so that's what my question was have you compared your device with but now the fact that it's no longer under production probably makes it redundant so you yes, have to it does. Uh, yes but the 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 data the two devices used to give in the five years of overlap was actually fabulous Uh, so there was a lot of uh, correlation that was there yes the correlation was super okay so we can easily one can easily if interested go for the corvus now yes yes absolutely okay. it's a wonderful so uh, i think uh, one thing which i saw with the corvus st was that uh, there are a lot of parameters which it throws up and uh, they indicates that the uh, the cornea is not fit for a refractive surgery the tba and such parameters which are there and uh, i in my own uh, uh, experience have seen that all those cases which i found they were okay and i've been doing uh, in those cases i would say that 20 to 30% of them became you know uh, unsuitable for uh, laser vision correction surgery the lasik or uh, such pr- procedure so uh, you you think that these uh, machines are slightly over reacting considering that you have so much experience on aura and maybe uh, you have compared it with the corvus as well um yes i think the corvus is again uh, it's uh, it's under evolution really uh, so there's so much that that instrument is giving us which we have not still been able to analyze and fix uh i think uh, rohit who's part of the group has been uh, fairly closely involved with the biomechanics development and maybe it's a question that uh, he might like to also address okay. uh, but i feel that uh, uh, just like earlier we used to i remember when we started uh, lasik surgery i'm talking 1995 i did patients with a minus 22 uh, yeah. which i wouldn't dream of doing now Uh, nobody knew about pta nobody knew about abnormal topographies uh, nobody knew about the, the biomechanics and that patient is still doing fine he's still got a six diopter residual myopia but he's happy from his minus 22 getting corrected 16 diopters so there are patients like that you get away with uh, with i mean today you'd never get away so i think what's happening is that these machines are giving us that little additional input to reduce the number of patients who will slip through the net and develop an ectasia and that's what one has to understand that every technology that is now coming in has additive value it is not by itself uh, something that will uh, will uh, you know make you take a decision so you have to base it on other data as well so i think uh, i would agree with that because uh, these machines are, give, are supposed to give you a safety net a margin and therefore you are on the side of caution and i think uh, we've all done those 14 15 diopters but uh, rishi i think that was beginner's luck yes <laughs> more than anything yes so in fact uh, earlier we used to think that uh, higher myopia corrected with the lasik will be a better bet compared to doing it with prk because we did not have the system where we could take care of the haze at that point in time created with the prk so i was in fact doing more power correction with the lasik as compared to prk prk was limited to something like two or three diopters only but uh, yeah anyway uh, has dr uh, rohit shetty joined us yeah, he has yes sir so him briefly yes so yeah so i will invite uh, dr rohit shetty he will be speaking on biomarkers in understanding etiology of ectasia 
डॉक्टर रोहित शेट्टी इज वन इंटरनेशनल फिगर इन इंडिया हु हैज डन अ लॉट ऑफ रिसर्च वर्क एंड ही इज आई वुड से ही इज द primarily a scientist and uh, then an ophthalmologist he has done so much of scientific work especially in the field of biomarkers so welcome dr shetty and start your talk please thank you thank you sir thanks again uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity being sorry sir sorry sir interrupt sir please remove virtual background sir please sir you uh, overlap your face sir please sir i don't know how to do that here Please click on start video arrow, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. It's fine. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Bharti, sir. Uh, we've been uh, doing this course for a long, long time, and really enjoyed this. Uh, it's one of the longest courses I think I've been part of. The biomarkers in understanding uh, etiology of ectasia. These are my financial interests. Uh, this, I'm not going to go too deep into this slide, but what it just says that there's a huge amount of interaction between what happens from the outside world and what happens in the inside world of corneal tissues so how does it really affect us when you look at post lasik ectasia or any ectasia one of the major factor which comes to mind is uh, the power of eye rubbing and uh, we have started looking at why do people rub their eyes it's not that they have uh a kind of fetish just to rub it or just that there is something happening one of the things which clearly uh clearly finds a role is the role of ige and it is how it impacts your eye rubbing and we have made this algorithm which is all these papers are freely available on igo looks at all the allergies which kind of triggers it to make the person have a mild sensitization to rub and the higher level of ige we even look at uh, treating them with a slit therapy like sublingual immunotherapies and all that to stop the eye rubbing completely and that stops the progression of ectasia both post lasik and pre lasik so this is how the, we look at see the ige less than 300 look at lot of uh, topical medication for that more than 300 get an immunologist opinion patch test desensitization that their avoidance of allergen desensitization with sublingual therapies and we have to probably think about and tropical immunotherapies uh, for them before we do cross linking and this is uh, this what i just explained uh, ocular surface inflammation has been uh, very predominant in post lasik ectasia also this is a paper we published this is how a post lasik nerves heal and the real post lasik no ectasia and post lasik ectasia you look at the nerves are completely fragile and when we looked at the markers when we looked at what those tears contain it's like it's most kind of a cytokine storm like a picture there with a huge amount of unwanted inflammation which may be driving the cornea weak these patients do complain of uh, osdi change and you can see that lot of this osdi have been associated with dendritic cells and other parameters we also have uh, issues related to genetic markers which looks at uh, we published this work with a you know stored lenticule we were able to pick up a gene which was defective in a patient who developed ectasia uh, we call it a lysyl oxidase now why is it important and how does it impact a management first thing we have to understand is the relationship between collagen and inflammation if you understand that then it helps us to really think about giving a very proper level of treatment these are the collagen structures what i'm seeing and this areas of this entangled uh, structures or enzymes called lysyl oxidase hold the collagen tighter we did an experiment where we had the same kind of collagen from the cornea and uh, we started uh, you know inducing inflammation once you induce inflammation we started seeing that the collagen structure became weaker just like how would how you would see it in a keratoconus now what is interesting here this is in western bot analysis of that the lysyl oxidase is these structures here which holds the collagen and this is a collagen uh, 4 5 and 1 when you induce more of inflammation like an mmp9 when this inflammation increases the lysyl oxidase drops down 
the collagen drops down. That means that more the inflammation drop is on the collagen. Structurally, it drops the collagen and uh, the lysol oxidase. That means you don't need to rub. Just the subclinical inflammation is enough. And this is what I feel happens in post-glacic ectasia because you end up in having a poor corneal nerves, more inflammation, more cytokines, improper healing, and this would induce changes. And patients who had a habit of, again, rubbing, it's like a double whammy effect. And of course, added to a genetic, genetic changes. So this is in keratoconus, not post basic ectasia. In a subgroup of these people, because we had this experiment with us, we published this in IOBS in 2015, where we looked at using cyclosporin to see if it can stop it. And we were quite surprised about the number of patients who were able, it was able to stop and from progression. This is a very interesting study and we still continue to do it uh, before we do any cross-linking. Harmon and balance has to be looked into when you're looking at uh, post-basic ectasia, but that's not the only one. Thyroid diseases combined with hormonal changes is a very important factor to cause ectasia. Thyroid is a very important factor which needs to be kept in mind. The nutrition, Again, one of the major areas of my interest has been vitamin D and vitamin D, B12 has been implicated. Vitamin D has been implicated even in COVID. Patients who had severe, uh, severe COVID in ICU, one of the major factors they found was vitamin D. And this, again, in a lot of our patients, including post ectasia patients, is very low. So it's, again, like one more factor to be looked at when you probably need to treat them. And, you know, treating them is very important before even you think about a cross-linking or any of these procedures. The question always comes is, when do you cross-link? Because, you know, once you see a post lasic ectasia, first of all, you're feeling very sad because you feel that you've missed something. But I, you can have, you may be having a perfect topography, but you may have had so many of the changes which is have absolutely no control with you like uh, wound healing, the corneal nerves, and all those factors. Just to summary on this, I always look at the IgE before I even think about cross-linking. I take care of the vitamin D. I give them time. I give them time for it to settle down. Every time you see an ectasia, there's no need to jump and do anything on them. Take care of their dry eye. Take care of the OSDI if it's high. Take care, you, you know, if it's a myboman gland dysfunction, take care of its steroids. Trehalose works very well with them because it is a it, 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 it changes the uh, relationship of MMP9 and uh, lysol oxidase. All this has a huge impact in making it more stable. Which is the most ideal procedure? When it's progression, when you're 100% sure it's progressing, then probably cross-linking. I use a Dresden protocol here. And when your quality of vision is poor, then you can look at impacts of cross-linking but when it's stable, try to at least give them time for a year, even though you see a patient coming to you with ectasias. And the inferior cone works wonderfully well. And uh, post-operatively, you can look at uh, scleral contact lenses or an ICL at the end of the procedure. For me, uh, single cone inferiorly is probably the best. If there's one indication for me in, uh, for intax today, it's, uh, I, for, it's for post lesic ectasia. And post-op, again, I look into all this. I use a, some kind of a copper supplements. The copper is necessary for uh, collagen and lysol oxidase synthesis. So it kind of, I don't know how much it really helps, but at least you have something. So why not use this? So that is one of my ways of looking into this. This is an important question. Should we cross-link everybody who comes to you with post lasic ectasia? To answer this, we've been studying this uh, a new technique called polarization sensitive OCT, which starts looking at your collagen fibers. This is an electron microscopy picture. This is the darker is your central region. The periphery is your fibers here, which is different, dif different in color. Most of the post basic ectasia patient, if you just remember this, the darker blues are normal. The peripheries are in different colors. And this is how a normal collagenia should look. Look at the post basic ectasias. You can see that all post lasic ectasias do not look the same. Some of them, after seven years, eight years, 10 years, who just show on topography as post lasic ectasia, 
still looked the same as a healthy eye. Look at the healthy eye here. And some of them, for example, this one, who is a post nine years one, may be a little different because look at the blues are different. But this topography here may not progress. And if you operate on this kind of patient, you may end up in a more scarring because healthier corneas you cross link, they end up in scarring or excessive flattening. So post classic ectasias may on topography look scary, but all of them may not progress. And this is the kind of work we are doing. So that's why I said, give time for at least six months to eight months. Only if it progresses, do it. Because many of them, they might have self-aborted itself. And this is just a, a simple comparison of, again, the same slides, what I wanted to share. Thank all my team for this. And thanks, Sudan, sir, and all the people, uh, all my friends, Dr. Rishi, Dr. Ashu, for uh, inviting me again. Thank you, Dr. Rohit, for wonderful talk. As always, your talk is so interesting and so complete in itself. It is very nice to have you as a faculty here in this course. Uh, anyone has any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rohit, can I? <clears throat> so the last bit that you talked about seems very interesting. Could you elaborate upon that a little more? What was the, how are you imaging? Are you, is it a simple topography or what? No, sir. Uh, we always uh, were very keen to look at the collagen imaging. Mm -hmm. And collagen imaging uh, has its own limitation because of the light it uh, uh, absorbs. So we developed this OCT, which uses the polarization sensitive OCT. It's, um, it's self-made, made in our own lab with help from uh, Optics University of Vienna. They are the pioneers of optics. And this uses the same birefringence principle of a GDX. If you remember GDX, yes, yes, for the yes. same GDX principle is used, but on the mm -hmm. corneal plane. So it, used the, it uses the, it looks at the polarization of the cornea and it tells you what type of corneal, corneal collagen you have. So mm -hmm. looking at it, a completely new dimension of uh, uh, thought process is emerging about many things, because now we are actually showing how a collagen of a cornea is uh, shaped. Okay. And you can also study the same thing on the retina. You're picking up things. This, uh, is, this is three microns resolution. This, the smallest resolution the OCT can do, two, two and a half on the cornea, uh, around two on the retina. So this is a regular OCT that you've adapted with your- No, sir, it's a completely new hardware. Uh, okay. of, uh, it uses the polarized light. Yeah, like how GDX is. So Rohit, it, uh, it assesses the quantum of the collagen and the quality of the collagen, but what about the biomechanics of the collagen? The, how does if it- If Sudan sir it, allows me, I can share this slide. Why not? Go ahead, please. This is very interesting. I should not take up anybody else's uh, time. Go ahead. You can use another three, four minutes. There's no problem. Sir, this is, uh, Vishy, sir, this is how it looks. Uh, for example, this is electron microscopy picture of corneal collagen. The peripheral fibers are different. The central are different. You can see the exactly the same thing. This is uh, my picture of how my collagen looks. Look at the biomechanics. The bad D is normal mm -hmm. and uh, the CBI, TBI are completely normal, healthy eye. Mm -hmm. Now look at this. The bad D is closer. And as you keep moving in, your blues become lighter and lighter. You know, you can call it the turquoise blue from, you can call it the Indian ink color. The darker is better. And as it comes closer, now you can see that, that the layers of collagen is completely changed. And that's why you can see that this is, and then you can see that the biomechanics which are healthy here is suddenly showing some changes here. So it correlates very well to the CBI, sir. So right. I feel... Oculus CBI is probably, according to me at this point of time, the most strongest indicator because it's not dependent on your epithelium and other changes on the topography. Yeah, that's that's brilliant, uh, Rohit. I think I, I yeah quite understand that. So um, so the the focal nature of the biomechanical disturbance. Uh, how are we sure that our biomechanical uh, devices are actually picking it up? Because in the end, the puff is only fired in a certain area, uh, but how does it pick up uh, or can, will it miss if it's a focal area, which is ectatic or eccentric rather, uh, won't it miss it? Sir, if your uh, early changes of ectasia is always be sometimes focal, 
sometimes it will be generalized corneal weakness if it's a generalized corneal weakness you'll see the biomechanics weaker even with the corneal thickness of 600 microns but if it's a local area and it is not in the center like a pellucid sir if you classic example is pellucid sir right if you do a pellucid your biomechanics is normal because pellucids half the cornea is normal other half is abnormal that's why you do crosslinky on a pellucid you always end up in a different kind of scarring right right <laughs> yeah thank you thank you dr roy thank you sir finding us in time and uh, i think if you stay back uh, maybe at the end of the session we'll ask more questions i'm here only sir yeah thank you very much um, uh, we'll go forward now and uh, we'll be talking about uh, uh, interpretation of the corneal imaging and the uh, the talk will be taken by dr ashu agarwal he is very in much interested in corneal imaging as a, corn, a prolific cornea surgeon of delhi dr ashu agarwal please thank you dr bharti thank you for this opportunity to be in your course and uh, today i'll be talking about uh, corneal imaging it's by no means a topic which can be covered can be covered in 10 minutes but anyway i'm going to give it a try and uh, so uh, can you see, see the screen yes sir let's start sir okay fine yes we can okay fine thanks so i'll be talking about interpretation of corneal imaging for a refractive patient and the objective of course is to ensure that we do not end up with certain unfortunate incidents like keratectasia no financial interest in any of the devices equipment techniques mentioned so corneal topography essentially is the essential component of refractive screening now and the objective is to detect corneas with dactic disorders established ones and also which are easy to detect and also detect corneas which are at risk for ectasia which is the more difficult part and there in the need for some newer devices so topographic topographic systems can be placebo ring system based like the reflective ones which we've been using traditionally for many many years since the residency days and the elevation based which are the scanning slit system and the shimflo camera based so uh, the shimflo elevation topography is the standard of care now for refractive screening the placebo alone would not work well there are combination devices which would help so let's look at uh, color coding now the maps are presented as a color code uh, they are color coded maps and uh, the placebo based uh, show the corneal curvature is measured and is shown as colored maps and in elevation based the elevation is shown as colored maps now if, what is the need for this if you look at this picture here you will see some placebo images what does it convey to us nothing much except that there are some rings but when you process the image when the device processes the image the topographer and presents it as color data this is how it becomes and you are able to interpret so uh, for curvature maps surface curvature is measured and the warmer colors show steeper curvatures or higher powers as we call them which are the reds and the oranges greens are more of the usual curvatures and uh, represent normal corneas and the cooler colors like the blues they show uh, relatively lower powers or flatter curvatures as we call them but please note that standard color scales actual power values the intervals and the colors actually used differ from machine to machine and should be standardized you cannot just compare one uh, uh, print out from one to the other for relative elevation there is a reference surface which is taken i'll talk about it a little later and anything above that is called anterior or anything posterior that that is uh, shown as a uh, cooler color like blue color and, and green is the surface for the reference surface and anything higher than that or the anti anterior to that is uh, shown as a warmer color like the reds and oranges so these elevation systems provide much more information than topography and the we have the, as i said the scanning slit based or the op scan and the shimflo camera based like the pentacam series galili and there are various other refinements also in each of these so now why curvature and why why just why not just curvature which was tradition and elevation now so if you look at this sphere and in this there is a segment called cd which has which would have been here but has been depressed and it's at a different elevation it's a lower lower elevation if you look at it the curvature of a and b is the same in c and d so if you're limiting ourselves to curvature maps we would say that the curvature is the same but the actual fact is that it's at a lower level so elevation maps give us some more information too 
Now, elevation map seen by itself would not mean much. Now, this is a Google image of the Himalayas, which we know are more than eight kilometers in height from the sea level. So if you just look at it, it does not convey much. It's a flattish thing. Okay, you see some uh, snow-capped peaks over here. But when you take it with compared to a reference surface, which is a sea level, you realize, oh, it's a pretty high one. And if we were to see, uh, show a bigger uh, area, the sea would have been covered. So uh, reference surfaces are close-fitting surfaces. And we try to get a best fit surface. So for instance, if this yellow line is the uh, actual object, objective, and then we get a sphere of a surface which is closest fitting to it. And then we compare. So anything higher than this close fit sphere, best fit sphere would be shown as a warmer color. Lower ones would be shown as cooler colors. Now this thing would make a little more sense, which I talked about. A, re a reference surface, which is green, and anything higher or anterior would be warmer. Lower or posterior would be in the blue uh, cooler colors. So these are the various, uh, so I'll be focusing on shame flip topography, which I feel is the standard of care for refractive surgeries and the various devices, the primarily the pioneer and so-called gold standard now is the Pentacam, but the other device is also very good. So a Pentacam has a rotating chamfer camera, which provides sharp and crisp images of the anterior segment and provides a lot more data than traditional topographers and therefore is known as a tomograph. It provides data from anterior coronal surface to the posterior capsule of the lens. And it is based on the Scheinflug rule. What happens basically is that in conventional cameras, the object plane, that is a film plane, the lens plane, and the subject plane, that is the subject, uh, they are all parallel to each other. Whereas in Scheinflug cameras, they can be oriented at an angle to each other and they intersect at a point called the Scheinflug interaction or line, intersection or line. So this is the Scheinflug camera, if you remember these older cameras. This is the lens plane, the film plane, and the subject plane, and they can be, they need not be aligned. And the advantage is that images along the optical axis of the eyes can be assessed too, and which was a big disadvantage with the placebo-based topographers. So uh, this, these systems give us precise measurement of the central cornea and correction of eye movements is there. There's very easy fixation of uh, target for the patients and it, uh, the acquisition time is extremely short. In two seconds, you get a lot of data. So they do uh, help us analyze anterior chamber. The pachymetry maps are given. Topography maps, both anterior and posterior are given. The elevation maps are given for both the anterior and posterior surface. It helps us analyze the cataract. The Bellinum Ruzer enhanced dis aphasia display is given, which is very important. The holiday report, which when you use for post-refractive surgery, cataract surgeries, the tomography is there and the coronal wavefront all is in, in two seconds. So how is the data presented? There are various display formats. The commonest one being the four-map refractive, where you have the front surface, the back surface, the coronal thickness, and the tangential or the curvature map. And here you have the identification data. The, this is the coronal front surface keratometry values and the astigmatism and the axis at which it is, the coronal back surface. Then you come to the pachymetry, which is there, the center, the thinnest, and the local point, and the uh, anterior chamber depth. So this, this uh, is another display where you get the keratogonous indices are given. And the pachymetric display is also given where uh, the, this helps us in, uh, basically gives us pachymetry across the surface of the cornea. And you can say how, see how it progresses, how the pachymetry changes across the surface of the cornea. And it's a good screening tool for classic patients. So coming specifically to the screen parameters, we check the best size of the best fit sphere because this influences the borderline numbers. If it's an eight millimeter size best fit sphere, the numbers should be, would be different compared to the nine millimeter one. And then we look at the anti-elevation map, the central and the paracentral areas. In the nine millimeter zone best fit map sphere, the anterior elevation, uh, the highest point should not be more than 15 microns because then it is indicative of keratoconus. Less than 12 is normal and anything between 12 to 15 is suspicious. In the posterior map, there are numbers are similar, about five microns higher. For instance, the, in the, uh, for keratoconus indication, it would be 20 microns or more in the posterior map. For eight millimeter zone of best fit sphere, as I said, it's different. Uh, and for on the anterior map, anything less, more than eight microns is indicative of keratoconus, and the posterior, anything more than 16 is indicative of keratoconus. So if you look at this map, you see this is a post, uh, posterior surface. Let's just look at the posterior surface to save time. There's about plus two over here. And as I said, plus 20, and in the best fit sphere, it's an eight millimeter. So anything more than eight would be indicative. So this is a normal map. And here again, eight millimeters, but the values here are 74 and 59. So this is much more than uh, 12, so then it is indicative of uh, keratoconus. Uh, there could be a keratoconus. So you need to be cautious, but when you look further, you see the uh, keratoconus indices all are highlighted over here. They're all positive. So coming to the other important aspect, the Bellin embryo is enhanced ectasia. Now, what does it do? 
as usual it will uh, depict the whole sphere uh, the best fit sphere is for the whole sphere and then enhance by remove ignoring the central 4 mm zone around the thinnest spot and the advantage is it gives us a pronounced cone and a traffic like evaluation so if this were the keratoconus corner this is the central bulge you, this is the thinnest area you remove you ignore the 4 mm around it and this is what this is the best fit sphere for this if you ignore it you'll get a best fit sphere like this and the difference is mapped and that gives us the enhancement and lets us know that okay there's something happening in contrast in a normal cornea this is the best fit sphere even if you remove the central 4 mm around the thinnest spot the map would remain essentially the same and there would be no difference so this is what happens in the best fit sphere when it is compared this is what you see here and when you see the, see the difference in the map this is the normal standard best fit this is the enhanced best fit and the difference here shows a higher uh, shows the red light uh, shows the uh, difference here and this gives a traffic like kind of signal is red uh, green and yellow green is okay if the central entire thing is green is okay and uh, red shows that it's abnormal and yellow you should be suspicious so this is another map to show uh, billin ambrosio enhanced display uh, th this is billin ambrosio display 2 where the d value anything more than uh, 1.8 or 2 is considered suspicious so corneal thickness spatial profile essentially shows how the cornea is thinning out towards the periphery and uh, any dipping down of this axis over uh, in these graphs cutting across they should all stay between between the dotted lines any cutting across is uh, doubtful the last important point that i want to discuss is the ambrosio relational thickness art map basically it uh, is the relation between the uh, art value and the progression pachymetry progression index which is all given in the map and any cut off value it is uh, it is shown over here in this area it's 456 here anything uh, 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 less than 400 we should avoid refractive surgery that's a recommendation and anything more than 339 and uh, less than 339 is indicative of keratoconus and 391 is uh, susceptibility for ectasia so here you see it's a normal art value everything is looking normal over here the these uh, billin ambrosio display is one is good two is good the lines are normal this graphs are normal ctsp profile is normal the art max is good and in contrast in this map you see the values here it's plus 22 it's a little more for a 9 mm it should not be more than 20 it is you become suspicious you look at the billin ambrosio display it's showing uh, some abnormality here the billin ambrosio display 2 is also one more than 1.8 it's a little suspicious the graphs are slightly dipping down but not cutting across but the art max value is 377 as i said anything under 400 you should be suspicious and 392 you should be suspicious and avoid a refractive surgery in the first instance in this patient i would like to observe for some more time here also similar features the other eye of the same patient uh, the art max is normal so uh, is, uh, is not su is suspicious sorry 362 and uh, sim uh, similarly in this patient you see uh, here actually you could observe the art max is 400 and uh, this is if you notice a very high astigmatism and that could probably account for it so we still haven't got over high astigmatism because sometimes they mimic these uh, changes in the corneas i think this is a good time to conclude uh, cornean topography is an important tool today and requires some effort to understand initially and uh, it is important for refractive surgery screening and detecting ectatic normal cor no corneal disorders Newer topography systems perform multiple functions and may provide more value for money but uh, remember there's no ideal and perfect system available yet and we still have to look for it and use a clinical judgment. Thank you for a patient hearing. There's some scenarios, but I think we'll I'll skip it in the interest of time. Thank you, Ashu. Thank you, Ashu, for making this very difficult subject, very understandable, very simple. And I appreciate your efforts. You have been taking this talk for many, many years now, nearly, I would say 15 years, we have been doing this course and you have always taken this imaging system, which is excellent and uh, makes the things so easy. Uh, I'll go forward. I'll ask uh, Dr. Bhupesh to take his talk on interoperative variables and their modifications. Uh, Dr. Bhupesh Singh is a, primarily a cornea surgeon uh, and uh, uh, doing a lot of refractive surgery, in, including smile. I'm primarily doing a lot of smile, uh, but he'll be talking out about the, uh, the, the variables. Dr. Bhupesh, please. Thank you, sir. And uh, my topic is interoperative variables and their modification.
Okay. So. So, uh, normal corneal topography is the prerequisite for performing defective surgery, and it's nicely explained by Dr. Ashu. Understanding corneal biomechanics is another important factor, which is discussed by Dr. Rishi Mohan. And there are multiple factors that can affect corneal biomechanics adversely and turn normal cornea into ectatic cornea. So, this, is a, this was a study published in Seminar of Thelmology in 2018, where they have find out the incidence and clinical characteristics of post lasik ectasia cases. And they have reviewed around 30,000 cases, out of which they found that the, in cases of ectasia in which the patients develop ectasia, the thin cornea was, the, was found in almost 50% of the cases, in which the thickness was less than 500 micron. And the important factor was anterior topographic map irregularity, that is asymmetric bow tie, in around 40% of the cases. The next risk factor was the ectasia risk factor score of more than three was present in 40% in of the cases. Next is percent tissue thickness ablation, which was seen in 20% of the cases in which PTA was more than 40%. Other important factors that they have found is low residual stromal bed of less than 300 micron in 30% of the cases. So these were the, some of the risk factors. So in this presentation, I will discuss how we'll play with these factors and get a good outcome in these cases. So the common risk factors for ectasia are younger age, thin cornea, high myopia, thicker flap, and low residual stromal bed. So if you talk about modifiable factors to achieve good post-surgical outcomes, flap thickness is one with, with, with which we can play around optical zone, optical zone size, stromal hydration, and surgical technique. So these are different interdependent variables like flap thickness, residual stromal bed, opti optical zone, pupil size. So these are interdependent with each other. For example, if you use a thick flap, you will have low residual stromal bed. Or if you use a larger optical zone, again, you will have a low residual stromal bed. So these are interdependent factors. So first of all, I'll discuss with flap thickness. Fla uh, LASIK flap creation is a crucial step in determining the outcomes of LASIK surgery. Flap thickness may vary from 90 micron to 120 micron in routine LASIK cases. Flap thickness sometimes goes up to 150 micron in some cases due to incorrect technique or wrong suction ring selection. This was a study in which the, they have seen the factors affecting laser uh, LASIK flap thickness comparison of two microkeratome heads. So different keratome heads can have a different accuracy in flap creation. So they have compared the SVK 90 microkeratome in group one and M2 90 microkeratome in group two. And they found that there was a statistically significant difference was seen in flap thickness between different surgeons. And they also found that the, if you use larger suction ring, the flaps are even thicker. So in this study, these are the factors which are positively correlated with the flap thickness. And there are some factors which are negatively correlated with, some, some, with flap thickness. So central corneal thickness, room humidity, larger, larger suction ring, and right eye. So they have a positive correlation to, achieve, to get a thicker flap. And whereas patients age, preoperative sphere and cylinder, and room temperature have a negative correlation. So we have to look carefully look on these factors while performing effective surgery. Uh, th uh, there is a study which compared the flap thickness with microkeratome flap versus femto flap. And they found that the deviation between the dif uh, different flap thickness in microkeratome group versus clamto group is entirely different. The deviation is almost more than 20 micron was observed in uh, only 0.73% of eyes in femtosecond group. Whereas in microkeratome group, this deviation is in 42% of the eye. So definitely femto flaps are more superior and more accurate. So femtosecond flaps have a better, better color position there are lesser chances of post lasik epithelial growth because of the better position. They are tissue saving because you can make a 90 micron flap easily with femtosecond laser. In cases of high myopia, femtosecond flaps are better. And in cases of low central corneal thickness, again, femtosecond, femtosecond flap is better. Coming to the optical zone. So the optical zone is the part of the corneal ablation area that receives a full intended refractive correction. Optical zone can be changed based on the magnitude of attempted correction, the mesopic pupil size, 
The standard optical zone is in between 6 to 6.5 millimeter in routine LASIK cases. Use of larger optical zone places patients at higher risk for development of post LASIK ectasia. So we have to be between 6 to 6.5 millimeter, but sometimes people size, because of people size, we have to change this optical zone. So this was a paper where they have made three groups with different optical zone. In group one, the optical zone was 6.2. In group two, it was 6.5. In group three, it was 6.9 millimeter. And in the results, they have found that the larger optical zone, the patients have a lesser uh, higher, higher order aberrations. So larger optical zone has its advantage, but when you are going for larger zone, you will have larger tissue ablation. Coming to the residual stromal bed, so this was a study where they have compared the results in the with different residual stromal bed thickness and see which patients progress to, progresses to ectasia. And they found that if you leave around 300 microns, the chances of ectasia is very less. Although there is no consensus that what should be the appropriate RSB. This was another study where they have, this is a meta-analysis and they have taken three different studies and they found that the higher the, higher the flap thickness, chances of ectasia is more. Coming to the pupil size, patients with larger pupil are not good candidates for LASIK. After LASIK, patients with larger pupil may suffer permanent disability debilitating visual aberrations, starburst, starburst, halos, multiple images, and loss of contrast sensitivity at night. The greater the mismatch between the laser optical zone or the effective optical zone and the maximum dark ad adapted pupil diameter, the more severe the night vision disturbances. So this is an interesting photograph in which you can see if you reduce the, reduce the uh, treatment zone from eight millimeter to six millimeter, almost your untreated area was, is reduced by 44%. So slight change in, in the treatment zone or pupil size can significantly increase the ablated tissue. The dark adapted pupil diameter is an important clinical variable when planning refractive surgery. The greater the initial myopic level, the more the pupil size affects. So there is a clear dependence exists between the initial myopic level an effect that pupil size can have on the retinal image after laser effective surgery. Stromal, hy stromal hydration also has a role in achieving good results after LASIK surgery. So one of the variables during LASIK is the amount of stromal hydration that exists during eczema ablation. Lifting the flap causes the stroma to begin to dry. So limiting stromal hydration during effective procedure is important to achieve the accurate results in LASIK surgery. If the stroma becomes rapidly dehydrated, the laser may ablate more tissue than intended, causing overcorrection of refractive errors. If the stroma is too wet, there is chances of undercorrection of refractive errors. So we have to maintain adequate hydration. Unexpected refractive outcomes can include astigmatism and central islands if there are fluctuations or transient changes in coronal hydration during the surgery. So stroma hydration has to be adequate and throughout the procedure. Preoperative screening and planning is the most crucial part of refractive surgery and modifying treatment variables can help in achieving good surgical outcome and avoid post lysic ectasia. Thank you. Very nice talk, Dr. Bupesh. Really enlightening everything of the course which was left over right? and you can interplay for giving better results and decreasing the risk of uh, developing ectasia by managing the things during the surgery. Thank you. Dr. Bharti. Uh, before I ask, invite you to talk, there were a couple of things very interesting which are brought out with the, by the talk from Dr. Bhupesh. And uh, uh, one of them is the uh, room conditions, the OT conditions, the humidity, temperature, and leading to, the, and their role in, you know, situations which can lead to ectasia, whereas uh, uh -huh. the very preoperative measurements may be within the normal limits. So this is very interesting uh, thing, uh, despite, and despite the fact that you have checked everything, 
still the room conditions like humidity and temperature play a very very important role which uh, should be emphasized in all the ot's uh, especially the laser ot's that uh, we are looking at uh, any comments from dr rishi on that well, i think it's uh, um, i think you absolutely brought it out the room temperature and the room humidity has to be kept in a very narrow band for <laughs> consistent results uh because the and also the technique the time that it takes for you to uh, you know put the flap or reflect the flap the time it takes you to start the machine the time it takes you to deliver and the new machines deliver the treatment so quickly as compared to the machines going back uh, 15 20 years which used to take a good minute it used to go from one stage to another stage to the third stage and it used to take time while the cornea was exposed uh, that plus uh, the amount of hydration Uh, we do uh, will have a bearing on the ablation no question about it so thank you dr bupesh any other question uh, if there is any otherwise we'll go forward and i'll invite uh, dr purendra for the most important part of this uh, session which is uh, playing more and more important role the overview of the whole session along with the legal issues which are very important today because more and more people are getting uh, uh, you know legally very educated and legally uh, they they find try to find something uh, for legal you know issues in crop up so the word is aggressive i think not educated <laughs> Dr. Purendra Basin is a prolific cataract surgeon and a very reputed uh, surgeon in uh, Madhya Pradesh as in India and abroad, and has taken uh, all the courses everywhere in the ESCRS, ESCRS, and so many places. And uh, he is uh, also owner of large multi-specialty hospital, so he has all the knowledge of legal issues which can be brought into the medicine practice. Dr. Purendra Basi. Thank you, Dr. Bharti sir, for giving me this opportunity, and I am really happy. And uh, I have taken a lot of points from this course, uh, which is a really wonderful course. And uh, I will be sharing my this thing of uh, overview and legal issues. All the talks were very interesting, and all all the speakers, including you, were very very interesting and. they completed the course very nicely including dr rishimon dr uh, ashu dr uh, rohit chetty etc post latex ectasia as has been said earlier by dr bharti is a known risk factor and a rare but serious complication of laser visual correction there occurs progressive steepening and thick thinning of the cornea after corneal refractive surgery it can occur following any kind of refractive surgery like lasik it can be there in surface ablation it has been seen in with smile it was seen with radial keratotomy or astigmatic keratotomy surgery the hypothesis is the corneal refractive surgery disrupts and thereby alter the structural integrity of the cornea lasik reduces corneal structural integrity both by reducing overall available load bearing tissue and by shifting the load bearing responsibility to the structurally weaker posterior corneal stroma because we are making a flap and we are giving the load bearing responsibility to the residual stromal bed a uh, post lasik ectasia it was first reported in 1998 by theo siler in a case of former prostate keratoconus in majority of cases it occurs within a year of surgery in worse uh, one surgery it is reported to occur late 6 to 11 years after the lasik surgery and uh, has been uh, pointed out by dr rohit shetty that it has got some association with the hormonal changes pcod and uh, development of thyroid so this these can be the risk factors which can lead to uh, changes uh, systemic hormonal changes and changes in the corneal surface and corneal integrity in the later age group of during pregnancy lactation etc recent biomechanical studies have reinforced the importance of residual stromal bed thickness after lasik both stress strain analysis and cohesive tensile strength analysis indicate that corneal strength is significantly greater in the anterior 40% of the corneal stroma than in the posterior 60% further the corneal flap contributes minimally to the tensile strength of the cornea after the lasik so whatever so better it is to make a minimal uh, thickness of the corneal flap or do a 
uh, pro surface procedure which is now in, increased and uh, it has gained popularity. Thus, LASIK reduces corneal structural integrity both by reducing overall available load-bearing tissue and by shifting the load-bearing responsibility to the structurally weaker posterior corneal stroma. When the complication arises, it does not necessarily mean that the patient was a poor candidate for the surgery. That the surgery was contraindicated or that there has been a violation of the standard of care. Post LASIK ectasia typically is a result of abnormal corneal morphology or thickness. So, this has to be kept in mind and borne in mind. And that has been uh, overlooked prior to the surgery. So, risk factors for ectasia are, as has been uh, pointed out by others. Uh, that uh, preoperative susceptibility, uh, susceptibility of the cornea, the major risk factor should be looked at. Weak biomechanical properties like abnormal topography and, uh, and preoperative vegetative corneal diseases like keratoconus, formifrastic keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, they should be ruled out. And younger age patient where the cornea is not yet developed properly, that should be avoided. Patient, uh, sometimes the keratoconus, they, uh, uh, they appear at the later age group. And if you are operating at the younger age group, so we are missing that. And uh, low preoperative pachymetry is indicator uh, for the keratoconus development. Uh, risk factors for keratoconus are a severe biomechanical impact from surgery occurs by the high percentage of altered tissue, as has been very rightly pointed out by Dr. Bharti, that uh, PTA more than or equal to 40% is at risk. Low residual stromal bed due to excessive laser ablation for high correction or multiple retreatments when the residual stromal bed thickness is equal to or less than 250 micron or half of the pre-operative pre thickness, then there is an increased risk. We have made a thick LASIK flap this has been rightly uh, uh, pointed out by Dr. Bhupesh. Corneal thickness, degree of myopia, and restoral stromal bread are interrelated, and they can be played upon during the procedure. And we can decrease the risk of development of keratectasia. Small treatment zones causing abnormal focal stress distribution is another important factor which can lead to development of the keratectasia. And lastly, uh, there is, if there is any severe trauma after the surgery, like ex aggressive eye rubbing, which is common with uh, allergic conditions, or when we have done LASIK enhancements, and if there is any source of blunt corneal trauma, these are the risk factors which can lead to development of keratectasia. And most reported cases of ectasia after LASIK had at least one of the risk factors which are present with them. There have been case reports of ectasia developing in patients even without the risk factors after LASIK and surface ablation. Ectasia can also occur after uncomplicated surgery, even though candidates are appropriately skinned. So, so, but uh, definitely, the role of hysteresis has been shed by, said by Dr. Ishimon should be another important factor which has to be taken care of. So, incidence of post-operative LASIK, post-LASIK ectasia with older screening technology was 1 in 2,500. Now, with the newer screening technologies, it has come down to 1 in four to 5,000 cases. So, this has been a good thing. And coming to the second part of the talk of the malpractice lawsuit, which uh, now in our country has also increased in last few, uh, few many years, and they are uh, they bear an enormous responsibility on us, and because of the uh, the social media and and uh, active presence of everybody who come and uh, who can see and screen through the Google what has been the cause of decreased vision and why the, this complication has occurred. So lawsuits are increasing. So <clears throat> lawsuits for the LASIK are, account for approximately 30% of all ophthalmology malpractice claims. Patients state that they, are, they were not adequately explained the risk involved. They alleged that the doctor should not have proceeded with the procedure because of the patient had signs of keratoconus. So high astigmatism, high K values, thin corneas, they can be a risk factor if they are not 
been uh, addressed or the we have not asked the patient that uh, this is these are there are some risk factors in your condition but we can try it and if it develops then we can manage it we have to come for frequent follow up a prominent new jersey laser eye surgeon has agreed to settle a medical malpractice lawsuit for 2 million dollars after performing a corrective vision procedure on a man who should not who should have been ruled out due to a pre existing condition the lawsuit alleged that he was not properly screened before undergoing the eye surgery as he had a condition called, known as steep corneas which led to the bulging of the cornea known as corneal ectasia in both eyes so a simple steep cornea like 46 47 48 diopters can produce a lawsuit uh, on august 12 in 2011 a judgment in the amount of 45 million dollar was entered against lasik surgeon nick sarli md and his professional cooperation on june 2009 a magnetic jury returned a verdict against uh, dr nick sarli uh, against uh, versus dr devdas for his medical negligence in having performed lasik surgery on a patient who was not a good candidate for surgery because of the condition of the corneas as a result the evidence showed that mr devdas developed a visually disabling condition like post lasik ectasia the so post lasik ectasia is an important condition if it appears a patient can take you to the court of law another a case with the similar uh, condition of post lasik ectasia the patient had uh, the doctor be there Uh, liabilities of doctor arising under statutories in india is as per existing laws in india cases for medical negligence of the doctors can be filed under following enactments at the option of patient a complaint for deficiency of service can be filed before the consumer forum under the consumer protection act 1986 a civil suit for damages in civil suit can be filed a complaint under under section 304a opinion penal code in criminal law for for the attempt to decrease the harm the patient can also be filed a uh, complaint to the medical council of india or the state medical council for the de- registration of a doctor on account of negligence all these things uh, at all these places in india the patient can get to take you to the court of law several cases has been reported under against ophthalmologists and decisions have been taken by national consumer disputes redressal commission ncdrc it is reported that 942 cases of medical negligence were decided in from 2002 to 18 out of these 30 were related to ophthalmology a total of 73.3% of the alleged cases of medical negligence in ophthalmology were proved and compensation for the cases ranged between 2 lakh and 10 million so for variety of cases so it is very good part that aio has developed an informed consent for the ophthalmic various ophthalmologic surgeries including lasik and we now take this informed consent into account and uh, that is very, uh, very much available on net and uh, at aio site to summarize thorough pre operative workup should be done strictly follow the guideline explain all pros and cons to the patient and the attendants if in doubt better to wait or do not go for corneal refractive surgery at all take opinion from your experienced colleagues and uh, take a consent informed consent to conclude if you know the enemy and you you know yourself you need not fear the result of 100 battles if you know yourself but not the enemy for every victory you will also suffer a defeat and if you know neither the enemy nor yourself you will succumb in every battle so it is better to know it better uh, the role the development of ectasia and the importance of corneal topography and stresses and everything which has been del- uh, uh, the uh, referred to in this particular course i thank you dr bharti for giving me this opportunity to share my views and uh, share my experiences thank you i must congratulate you on this uh, excellent talk purendra wonderfully explained and especially the legal issues all the and uh, in fact with the millions about you were talking about the <laughs> lawsuit <laughs> it makes us everyone scary about scary. going forward with the refractive surgery which i have practiced for more than 25 years now and uh, not suffered any lawsuit till now 
but anyway this is these are changing times and difficult times so dr bharti that goes to show you know the enemy and we are by this course we are all trying to know, learn about the enemy yeah, yeah this course is really highlighting all these our enemies also, it also highlights the fact that you have good friends <laughs> uh, in the end uh, most suits will happen because of uh, talk by uh, some other practitioner who will say yeah. something negative yeah. and that's what initiates the process and i think that's what we also have to take home as a message from purendra stock is to be very careful what you say to the patient who comes to you uh, for another opinion uh, that uh, something that i think must be highlighted so i think doing a good job is one thing yeah but uh, you know things can go wrong and i can tell you i have had patients referred to me there's one patient who actually had bilateral ectasias and she had to get bilateral transplants to tell you honestly i went to uh, that point and there's no lawsuit yeah so uh, is... the credit i think goes to me uh, because uh, <laughs> i didn't let it happen you know it's yeah. just you how you put it to the patient that these complications can happen the patient was in myself right is best everything that he could he has all the proper you know, documentation and everything and you were a perfectly good case and so you know that little thing reassures them and uh, so i think that's very important yeah, i think there are some uh, key yeah, take home points from this sorry uh, yeah. sorry sir uh, ashu okay i'm trying to say that i have had a case of a lasik surgeon who operated upon his own uh, son and uh, the son developed ectasia oh. so uh, there is there is issues there are issues where people just think that a uh, couple of things they check or clinically and that is sufficient but these machines are a great help whatever you are using i think you must be very perfect in uh, using the machines and i would uh, at this point i would might some comments from dr rohit chetty is here so please uh, any any comment on the course or the important part of this uh, i would like to uh... speak on uh, parendra's uh, talk what he said about uh, the legal aspect and what dr rishi sir said uh, we had always our chairman used to always say one thing uh, because our 40 45% of our patients walking in are second opinions or third opinions being the tertiary opinion so every patient who walks in we know as you don't need to tell him about the disease so he always used to say every time a patient comes from a different place just for a minute think how would you treat if it was this your patient who you created a complication so minute that comes into and that has been a classic teaching for everybody pgs fellows doctors that minute you see an ectasia you would do exactly what dr rishi sir said you will suddenly become how would you manage if it you have created an excess you will say that well you know there are different things and you'll it's been such a wonderful one liner that i don't need to teach anybody anything on that you know how you write a report if it was your patient of ectasia would you write that the corneal thickness should have been checked i have seen reports written by people 510 microns the cornea thick was not good i mean come on minus 2 diopters you are correcting 510 is enough so i feel that everything happens because you assume that it's a good time to put somebody down if you look at the entire thing what purendra sir said can be avoided if you look at yourself as the person who treated that case then every single thing from the moment you say hello to the patient to goodbye i think you will become completely different person rather than looking at it as so oh, this dr rishi's case or is dr dr bharti's case i think this is the take home message for the last uh, 18 years and i keep telling it to everybody and it's worked wonders thank yeah. you very true at this point in time i would like to end this session thank my faculty who have uh, done wonderfully and the audience thank you very much and the aius thank, thank you sir thank you doctors and this was a very wonderfully moderated session by really great doctors great speakers and wonderful presentation